Hi, everyone. I am Debbie Schwartz, and I'm here with Chris Upkarians from Juno. Let me just um, click a little, a few little things here to let everybody in, and I am going to spotlight myself and Chris. Um, and thank you for coming in the middle of the day. This is, and actually, I'm just going to give a quick introduction, then I'm going to stream to Facebook, and then we'll get started. But um, this is what we call just an AMA, Ask Us Anything, I guess an AUA, AUA, Ask Us Anything. <laughs> and um, uh, we did this a few weeks ago. It was really helpful for people. You can um, ask us through chat or you can um, unmute yourself. We had people last time, honestly, just unmuting and, and directly asking their questions. We don't have slides, but you know we can answer any questions. We will try, we you know, can't promise that we will have the answers, but we will try and answer any questions that you have. Um, and let me just, I just put on captions and make sure, sorry. Uh, and Chris, do you mind? Um, introducing yourself or giving yourself a little background and I'm going to stream this to Facebook and then um, you know we will get started with questions. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you very much for the intro, Debbie. Uh, hi everybody, I'm Chris. I started a company called Juno about five years ago and the core of what we do is finding, uh, similar to Debbie, ways to help parents and families make sense of the complexities of student loans. So when I started Juno, the goal was a, a bit different than what you might normally see. Uh, I had to get loans to pay for business school. And one of my classmates and I tried an experiment to see if we could bundle together a few hundred folks who needed to get loans at the same time and ask lenders if they'd be willing to negotiate on the rates and terms that they'd offer to the group uh, such that they're better than what we would get on our own. And so you can think of Juno as a collective bargaining group for student loans and refinancing. And we've had the absolute pleasure of working with Debbie over the last few years and her entire team to have the opportunity to let more people know about what we do. Um, and on occasion to get on chats like this and see anything and everything we can possibly answer about undergrad student loans. So as Debbie mentioned, please feel free to use that chat box or to raise your hand or unmute yourself and we'll get through as many questions this afternoon as we can. So um, the first question we see, I see is about um, what specific loans are available, available to New York State residents. And maybe we can actually broaden that because we discussed a lot last time about the state agencies and what those student loans are about and how they differ from other student lenders that people might see um, like a Sally May. So I don't know, Chris, if you want to talk about that in general, then we can talk specifically about um, New York State. Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, some context to back it up. So when you were talking about student loans, there's really three buckets of potential lenders. There's the federal government, and we can talk at length about that, but there's just a few loan programs that you can get directly from the Department of Education, and they've got the same rates for everybody regardless of what your credit is. Then you've got private lenders. Think of those as banks, credit unions, and fintech lenders who are not associated with the government and sometimes can give you better rates if you have great credit, sometimes not. And you have this third bucket, which are the state-based nonprofit agencies. So uh, as far as I'm aware, New York State does not have a special program, but uh, some of these state-based nonprofits are able to provide rates that are far below what you get from anywhere else because they are able to borrow money really cheaply and they don't have any profit incentive. So the big ones that we recommend people look into typically are MIFA, which is the Massachusetts Educational Financing Authority. Um, so you can actually get lower rates through them that you can get from the federal government on many types of loans, as well as a company called Brazos, B-R-A-Z-O-S, which is a Texas-based nonprofit lender. And they're available for anybody who's going to school, uh, who has a Texas driver's license or ID and is going to school anywhere in the country, or anybody who's going to college in Texas, regardless of where their residency is. 
Um, and I think as of this morning, uh, that company has rates from like 2.7 to 6.9 something percent fixed. Um, so again, cheaper than all the loans that you can get through the federal government. And if you end up going to joinjuno.com and creating a, a profile, we actually uh, can help introduce you or at least uh, match you with any of the relevant state-based lending authorities that uh, we currently work with based on some of the answers that you fill out in your profile. So even though New York might not have a specific state agency, um, uh, you can still get the benefit at some of the state agencies who lend to out-of-state um, families in particular, and MIFA is one of the um, best ones that um, you don't have to live in Massachusetts. You don't, your student doesn't have to, to go to um, college in Massachusetts. They will um, lend to you regardless. And as um, Chris said, I'm just, you know, um, emphasis, reiterating that Brazos is, is um, only for Texas residents or if you're going to school in Texas. But the benefit of checking these lenders and other lender rates is to, you know, see what these lenders offer you and then, and we'll talk about it in a little bit more detail. And then, you know, um, if you create your account at Juno, Juno can then help say, you know, is that the best rate you can get or, or potentially you can go through um, lenders that they have arrangements with and they, those lenders can match um, the best rate you can get. So um, there's opportunities out there to make sure that you're shopping and that you're getting the best rate. Um, so the next question, incoming freshman, after we accept the standard 5,500 student loan, where do we go from there? We do need a little bit more than the 5,500. So what are our options? Are there other federal student loans or just private loans? Great question. So uh, for everyone's context, when you're looking at federal student loans, there's one loan program that you start with. It's called a federal direct loan, and it's in the name of the student directly. And it has pretty low rates, so it's five and a half percent fixed right now. Um, and the major benefit of it is that it has more protections built into it in case something happens after graduation and you don't have a job or you don't make as much as you thought you would. Um, there's a lot of protections built into it that let you limit the amount that you have to pay after graduation to a percentage of your income. The downside, as uh, was referenced in this question, is that the amount you can borrow through it, it is a pretty low cap. So for the first year of school, you can borrow $5,500. For the second year, $6,500. For the third and fourth year, $7,500 each. When you hit that cap on how much you can get through the federal direct loan, you have two options. Option one would be to use another federal student loan program, which is called a Parent PLUS loan that I'll talk about in a second. And option two is to check various private lenders and see what rates you might qualify for there. So Parent PLUS was made for this exact question, for this exact scenario. Uh, it's basically another program for the Department of Education set up where the parent borrows on behalf of the student. The loan is only in the name of the parent. The student isn't legally attached to it, but it lets you borrow all the way up to the cost of attendance. So if, for example, a school costs $30,000 a year and you are able to get $5,500 through the federal direct loan, you can borrow the full remainder through the Parent PLUS loan program. Uh, I'd say one of the positives of it is that everybody gets the same rate no matter what your credit is. That's also one of the downsides of it. So right now, for anybody who wants a Parent PLUS loan, which is that the other federal option after you cap that $5,500, the rate's 8.05% fixed, plus a little bit over a 4% origination fee. Uh, and if anybody has questions, I can get into exactly how that works. Uh, our recommendation is typically that if you have, if you do need more money after you've used that federal direct loan, that you compare what offers you might get from private lenders to what rates are available to you through the Parent PLUS program and see if, based on your credit, you're able to qualify for something cheaper. Um, let's see, there's a question about, is it best for a married couple to apply for a loan together, the spouse who makes more money but has lower credit score, or the spouse making less money but a higher credit score? So just to be clear, you 
even though you're married, you can't both be applying for the loan together. So that's the first answer to the question. So you have you do have to choose. And when I say that, I assume you're actually asking who would be the co-signer. Um, so the student is borrowing and, and one of the parents um, would be the co-signer uh, on a private student loan. Yeah, uh, maybe to just add to that, say that is the exact scenario. Uh, different lenders price their loans differently. And so uh, the two factors that drive the rate that you get uh, that are in your control are typically your, your credit score and your income. Uh, if your credit scores are not, uh, I'd say, dramatically different, then go with whoever has the higher income, uh, as long as they're both well above 700. Um, otherwise, go with who has the higher credit score. Um, and you know what, there's a question higher up, maybe we should answer before we get the further talking about, you know, um, applying for loans and, um, um, and checking credit. Um, so somebody asked, does every inquiry go on the credit report? Great question. So the way credit report, so let me back up for one second, because when you are checking your, uh, what rates you might be eligible for from different private lenders, most lenders at this point have what's called a pre-qualification tool or a soft rate check experience. And you can use that to get a pretty good estimate for what rates you might be eligible for without having to do a hard check on your credit. If you end up doing more than, let's say, submitting a full application at more than one lender, uh, that's the point at which you'll have to do a hard credit check, and then you'll get the exact rate you qualify for. Most of the time, the rate between a soft check and a hard check is the same. Uh, but say you submit multiple hard credit inquiries for a student loan. It, on Experian's website, they actually explicitly say that if you are doing multiple checks for the same credit category in a short window of time, they won't penalize you more than just doing the first one. And so it's structured this way so that you aren't punished for shopping around. Um, and in general, uh, the impact of doing a hard credit check should be relatively low and only last for a few weeks to a few months. Um, so just something to keep in mind. Um, oh, so there's a few questions here, but I'm gonna pick one and then we'll backtrack. Somebody's asking, is Sally Mae federal? And again, this is a great question and there is um, a lot of valid confusion about who Sally Mae is. Fantastic question. Short answer, no. Uh, but the reason why a lot of people still think Sally Mae is federal is that in 1972, they were established as a government-sponsored enterprise. And so for a long time, they were kind of a quasi-government agency. Um, but in more recent times, they are a standalone, privately owned company. They're publicly traded. And so they're no longer at all affiliated with the federal government. So if you are receiving um, you know, promotions from Sally Mae or seeing them advertised, which is fine, um, just know that they are a private lender. Um, you're not getting any federal protections or you're not taking out a, a federal loan if you apply to them. Um, I think the other confusion I used to have myself personally is that there's, a, there's an agency called Fannie Mae. So like it has a similar name. So that's why people still think of Sally Mae as federal, but um, it is a private company. So um, a, along the same lines, um, Lauren asked if a bill ever does get passed um, by the government, would it be applied to federal and private loans or just federal loans? Uh, good question. So any of the discussions that are happening right now in Congress um, are about uh, just federal loans. It is possible that private loans could theoretically be included at some point in the future, but extremely unlikely. So given that, kind of, you know, let's, we'll, you know, we're being kind of upfront with everybody here. What is the benefit of getting a federal loan? Like, uh, and, and before I should actually kind of preface, 
we strongly recommend, and actually most private lenders will tell you the same thing, that um, a student needs to max out whatever federal loans that they, they can get in their own name. And those are loans, as Chris talked about earlier, that are um, the direct um, student loans from the government. And they, they do have yearly limits. As a freshman, the limit will be 5,500. But if your student and your family needs to borrow, those are, that's the loan that they should always borrow first. And then if you need more above that, and somebody actually already mentioned that their student's taking the 5,500, but they need a little bit more, what other loans should they look at? So after they've met, after your students max out the federal loans, the only, the, the options are to get more federal loans, which are the private, the parent loans, or to look at the private lenders. And I'm just curious, Chris, maybe you can summarize, like, what's the pros and cons of going one way versus the other? Yeah. Yeah. Um... So I like to think of it as a decision tree. What are the reasons why? So the, the pros of the Parent PLUS loan, which is the, the federal option, are it really primarily that everybody gets the same rate no matter what your credit is, as long as you qualify. And most people will qualify. So uh, you're going to get that 8.05% rate plus that 4% origination fee if you have very little credit or almost perfect credit. Uh, and so for a lot of people, it ends up being the best option for them. Another pro of the Parent PLUS loan is that it does have some protections built into it, like income contingent repayment, so that if you are facing some financial difficulty, there is a little bit of leeway in order to, uh, let's say, have some flexibility around how much you owe or how much you have to pay monthly. Uh, it's less flexibility than you get with the federal direct loan, the one the student takes out in their own name that you just mentioned, but there is some. Um, one of the downsides of Parent Plus is in its name. It's actually only legally in the name of the parent. So the student isn't tied to the loan, doesn't show up on their credit report. They're not legally obligated to help pay it back. And for some people, that causes a little bit of hesitation or they want some more shared responsibility around it. Um, and then when you flip over to the private side, it, the way I think of it for the decision tree is Check your rates. Can you qualify for something that is cheaper than what you get from a parent plus option? And if so, uh, then it's worth considering. If not, then there isn't really a benefit of using a private loan over a parent plus loan. Um, okay, so now I'm, I'm going back to some of the questions. Uh, Teresa asked if for students that have been classified as an independent, are private loans the only option? Um, so if a student's been classified as independent, there's a very specific set of things that that means for the Department of Education. Uh, one of the impacts of that is the federal direct loan that we've been talking about for a few minutes here, it's that first loan people should start with. Um, it has two sets of borrowing limits. And so the $5,500 amount that you can borrow for the first year of school, that's actually for dependent students. If you're classified as independent, you can borrow a little bit more through that program. It's not much more, but a little bit more each year. Um, but that's the only real impact of being classified as an independent student, by the way. It's just that, in theory, you can borrow more from the federal government directly at those lower rates, but you still hit a pretty low cap. And after that, um, you would likely need to be using a, a private loan with somebody as a co-signer uh, if your parents are not going to qualify for the Parent PLUS loan. I mean, the only other benefit, and this isn't a lending benefit, is that if you were classified as independent in theory, you might have also had a lower um, income than than your parents, or you know. So in theory, you would hope that you would have also been offered more aid from the college, but um, we we can't we can't promise that. Um, so. Good question. Tracy's asking, my child recently decided to attend college that we would need to borrow to afford. We didn't fill out the FAFSA. What are our options? You can still fill it out. So I would highly recommend that you immediately after this presentation or call, uh, probably just start doing that if you can. Um, and I'd say immediately contact your financial aid office as well. 
now that we're in the beginning of August, financial aid offices are going to be inundated with a lot more requests and emails and phone calls than they get during the rest of the year. This is probably the busiest time that they have. And so uh, if you, and as we get closer to tuition due dates, some schools do have slightly different processes they set up for scenarios exactly like yours. And so my first recommendation, fill out FAFSA, second, email the financial aid office almost immediately if you can, just asking what steps you should take in order to get uh, federal funding in time for your tuition deadline. And just for anybody out there, so this year's FAFSA, which I always have to think for a second because they call it the 2023-2024 FAFSA because it relates to that academic year is actually open until um, June 30th of 2024. So technically, you know, for anybody out there who um, maybe you're not going to borrow in the fall, but you think you might have to borrow, um, you know, in the second semester, um, when, you know, you can actually fill out the FAFSA during all of next year. Um, um, so, but you, it's most likely you're filling it out to get access to federal funds. Um, you probably won't be able to get that much money from colleges directly, but just know that um, th that the deadline um, for when the FAFSA actually closes is is really late. Um, so if you haven't filled it out and your student wants to still borrow federal funds at some point, um, you can fill it out during the year. So another great question for, from Robert. We get this all the time. Um, it's natural this time of year. Uh, school starts in about two and a half weeks. We haven't done very much. Is it too late? Basically, is it too late to get started? It's never too late to get started. Uh... But now that you're two and a half weeks out, it's a, uh, the timeline is certainly compressed. So when it comes to a federal loan, you can still very likely get one in time for your tuition due date, as long as you have filled out FAFSA. And if not, I would email the school immediately directly. Uh, when it comes to a private loan, what uh, you really would want to make sure that you're applying today uh, so here's the, the process and, and, and how you could squeeze it into work in that two and a half week period. Let's say you apply today. You'll typically find out from any lender if you've been approved within two business days, often the same day. And immediately after, once you've been approved for a set of rates, if you like them, um, then you have the option to hit a button that says sign. It's you basically opting into saying that you want this. And then the lender contacts the school and asks, is your student an incoming um, student? And is the amount that you want to borrow uh, less than or equal to the cost of attendance? Basically, um, are you asking to borrow an appropriate amount? And then they say yes. And then the lender sends the money to the school two and a half weeks from now on your tuition due date. And so this is we're getting close to the minimum uh, amount of time it would take in order to process all of this. And so my recommendation would be to start today but to also in parallel talk to your financial aid office about what your options are to get federal funding in case you either don't qualify for a private rate that you like or it doesn't work quickly enough. But if you do qualify and you've accepted the loan, a lot of schools, as yeah. long as they know that that's in process, um, they will you know, still let your students start because they know the money is coming um because you know you've accepted the loan so um just reiterating and emphasizing what chris says get started and also um be in contact with the school so that they know what's going on yeah um another good question which we get a lot but it's it's um i'm glad to clarify somebody's asking do we take out a loan each year or can we get a loan for a lump sum great question uh so it's the former. You take it out each year. And there's really two reasons why. Reason one is that the amount that you're actually allowed to borrow is limited to that cost of attendance number. Cost of attendance um, is the sticker price for the school for one year. Every school publishes it on their financial aid website. It's made up of tuition plus fees plus some allowance for room and board and personal expenses. And so, first of all, you can only borrow up to that amount. Uh, but even if, let's say, you were borrowing, you didn't need the full cost of attendance for each year, and you were thinking, should I just borrow what I need for the next few years at once? The reason that's not the best idea is because you start accruing interest on the loan, 
as soon as the money is sent to the school. And so you'll be accruing interest on a much larger balance for a larger period of time. And you'd be better off financially if you took a smaller amount now um, and then another chunk in a year, another chunk two years, another chunk three years from now. The other um, you know, issue is that interest rates change every year, um, higher or lower. We can't necessarily predict, but um, but the the lender is going to want to be able to you know give you a, a interest rate um, um, at that time as it relates to all the other financial um, conditions that are happening. So um, they're not going to be able to commit to an interest rate at the beginning of four years and then give you that for the um, as, a, as a rate for all four years. Yeah. Can I ask a quick question in regards to the loan amounts? Yeah. Okay, regarding that, what you're saying, so we can get an estimate of what the loan might be. However, let's say it comes in, I borrow X amount, a higher amount, but the school costs less because I'm not being able to get a pinpoint Am I able, I don't want to take the full amount alone. I really only want to take what's exactly the cost of the school is, but not knowing exactly, are we able, if we have a surplus, are we able to deny that and have that returned back? So we're only really borrowing exactly the cost. Does that make sense? It does. Yes. yes. Uh, so just one really quick caveat and I'll answer that directly. Uh, so when you say the full cost of the school, um, I'm assuming you mean that cost of attendance number that the financial aid office has published, because by now they should have that number published out there. But that might Mine's be- a weird one. We have a weird, it's been weird for yeah. us. We've been cash flowing. So up until this time, we had all cash flow. And then we pulled the government loan, the, the one that doesn't incur interest or it's paid by the government. I think it's subsidized if I- remember yep. correctly yep. so we've been that so we're just now starting our loan journey so and we're not able and he's in a nursing program so it's it's done a little different than your undergraduate programs so trying to pinpoint a number and knowing what is going to qualify and then I'm the one who has the dependent which is another whole weird situation as well so I'm having on my end because the his school goes three semesters, so his grades won't post, and they won't let us do anything else, knowing where we are with funding for the next year until that last grade post. So I'm over here having to calculate a guesstimate of what it's going to be for the year. So I just didn't want if I over guess, I don't want to be interest on twenty thousand that we don't need. Does it so to to answer that directly, then you can always prepay that amount, so basically return it without. A oh, penalty. sweet. Okay. Yeah. And that's true for both private loans and federal loans. Uh, and, okay. Yeah. And Perfect. I've been told by the lenders, like if people are in the situation that you're talking about, to always ask for a little bit more to borrow, and then you can kind of um, cut back or prepay. What you know, as Chris is saying, it's a it's a little harder to ask for less and then increase it. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Um. Okay, so question about if a cosigner dies. Uh, so on a private loan, if a cosigner dies, uh, it, it varies a little bit lender to lender, uh, but typically the student is still legally responsible for the loan. But conversely, if let's say in a terribly unfortunate scenario that something happens to the student. Um, at this point, most lenders have a death and disability release clause in their uh, contract. So in that scenario, it would actually be wiped away. But but this is an important question to ask. And, you know, as we, Chris, we're, we're kind of giving slightly general answers. I would absolutely verify specifically with each lender what their policy is related to this. Um, is the interest rate affected when we put a freeze on our credit report to avoid credit fraud or, th or theft? Typically when you have a freeze on your credit and you're trying to check your private loan rates, it just won't work. Uh, so you typically have to unlock it while you're trying to do the check in order for you to get rates back. Uh, some lenders will, uh, in that process, will tell you explicitly the reason why they can't return rates is because your credit is frozen. 
uh, some are on slightly older systems that uh, won't tell you that that's exactly why, but uh, you should just make sure to unfreeze it if you have the opportunity to uh, right before you apply. So Robert's asking about um, that they are in the process of buying a home at the same time, I guess, that they're trying to um, borrow a loan for their student. Um, any tips or any issues that you think that they might run into? So the primary issue you might run into is that your mortgage lender will be looking at a debt to income ratio. Mm -hmm. And once you take out the student loan, you'll that ratio is going to be higher. And so um, depending on how much you want to borrow and let's say what your debt to income ratio is without the loan, it might end up making a material impact and it's certainly something you want to look into. Um, or it might have very minimal impact at, at all. It just honestly depends on, on what the DTI ratio is going to be for the home that you're planning to buy. And then you add in what the incremental debt is going to be from the student loan to see what the, the lender is going to be seeing on their end. So definitely talk to the mortgage lender, yeah. um, you know, and um, explain this and see what, you know, if they can give you a little bit more insight into how they're going to price the loan. Okay, a good question. And somebody already mentioned subsidized loans, but um, if maybe if we can explain what the difference is between subsidized versus unsubsidized loans, and this is referring to you know, the federal student loans that are offered to your student. Yeah, great question. So when you apply for financial aid and you get back a financial aid award a letter from your school, it'll typically tell you whether you are eligible for subsidized or unsubsidized federal direct loans. Now, this is the loan program where you can borrow 5,500 for the first year of school. If a loan is subsidized, what that means is the federal government basically pays the interest while you're in school. So that the amount that you owe the day that you graduate is the same as the amount that you borrowed on day one. An unsubsidized loan simply accrues interest during that entire time. So uh, if it's a 5.5% rate, you borrowed $5,000, after one year, you'll owe $52.50, and it'll increase until you graduate. Uh, the way you qualify for that, though, is based on uh, financial need. And so if in your financial aid application, you get classified as having a good, significant financial need, it's possible to qualify for subsidized. Um, so I'm going to combine a few questions here. Um, Chris, somebody's asking what Juno does, and maybe you could combine that with kind of the a little bit um, um, uh, an explanation again about the state loans and kind of like the process that people go, should go through in <clears throat> um, in looking for a loan and where Juno fits into the process. Sure. Uh so Juno exists to try to find the best possible non-federal student loan options for folks. And the way we do that is by aggregating demand for people who need to get a student loan for the upcoming semester, and then getting a network of banks and credit unions who are willing to work with us and provide either discounts on rates, cash back, or different terms um, that they give to the group that, that are better than what you get on your own. And so the, the way that process works for you is you literally just sign up on our website, enter basic information about yourself or the student, such as where you're going to school, what the graduation year is. And then we just use that to pair you or match you with the lender or lenders who we think provide the lowest rates for you. Um, and so from your end, it's, it's quite simple at this time of the year, uh, but in the background, we're constantly negotiating with a network of lenders. One of those, or a few of those, are, are state-based lending authorities. And so uh, as you can fill out a profile on Juno, if you're selecting that you're attending a school in Texas or that uh, your state of residence is Texas and you're going somewhere else, then we will be automatically matching you with a state-based lender who offers really low rates, um, plus some additional, uh, let's say, bonuses that are exclusive to Juno members. And so think of us as kind of like the, the matchmaking service. Um, and we try to connect a lot of these disparate lenders and a lot of the smaller and better ones 
uh, to you more easily. And um, just to back that up, and I'm really being honest, um, I've been working with Chris, I think this is the third year, and um, um, we really believe in what they're doing um, because it gives family, the, the biggest question we always get is, um, where do I get the lowest rate? And you know what? I can't answer that for people because we, I can maybe give you a kind of a direction, but, but where you get the lowest rate is going to depend a little bit on your financial situation and how the lender evaluates your, your financial situation. But to some extent, you know, um, Juno can help make you, make you, um, uh, feel more comfortable that you've gotten the best, best rates, um, because, you do your own, you, you can do your shopping, you can, you know, go see um, what rates you can get out there. And then Juno, Juno can say, um, you know, in the collective bargaining power that they have have, we either can give you a better rate or you might have gotten the better best rate out there. So they'll kind of give you that assurance that you've done the best that you can, or they can offer you something that's better. Yeah, and maybe thank you a lot for that. Um... One thing I didn't mention is that we have established a, a rate match program. So uh, if you're able to find a lower, so when you go on our site, you'll be able to check your rates with a couple of lenders that we work with quite closely. If you find a lower rate from a very long list of eligible private lenders, we have a really simple process set up where you contact us about it, let us know that you found a lower rate. And then we work with uh, one of our lending partners to match that rate and provide you with uh, 3% cash back on your loan. So if you shop around and you find something better from a long list of eligible lenders, um, then it's actually fantastic because we'll get you that lower rate and we'll get you 3% cash back on that exact loan. Uh, and I didn't mention this earlier, but signing up to Juno and using it is completely free. We don't take anybody's payment information. If you don't like what you see, uh, then please, by all means, just don't use any of the options that we have. We want this to be a trust-based thing where the only reason why you would choose to work with us is if we're able to present you with an offer that is better than your alternatives. If you find an alternative that is meaningfully better than what we're able to put out there, we have a process to try to match it and beat it. Uh, and if for any reason uh, you have any issues with that, please, uh, you can always book time with us. You can always email us and we'd love to learn what we can do better. And one other thing I will add for if you if there are families that happen to be on this call um, or watch it later, if you've committed to a loan already, um, and you haven't gone to Juno, so you might be thinking in the back of my head, did I get the best rate out there? Um, you can still go to Juno. You can still see if um, they can give you a better rate. Until the money is dispersed from that lender to the school, you can always change your mind on the loan um, and go to a different loan. So um, if you've made a commitment, because maybe you didn't know about this process, which is completely fair, um, I would still encourage you to go create the account at Juno, see if what you got is the best rate, and then uh, make a decision. Again, as long as the money hasn't been dispersed, you have the chance to change your mind. Absolutely. Okay, another good question. It, Sally May keeps coming up, but that's okay. Uh, we love kind of clarifying this. Kelly's asking, I heard that Sally May is the one, is one of the only or only private lender that lets co-signers co opt out of the loan after a year of on-time payments. Is this true? And maybe we can talk about what she means by opting out. Like what, what, what feature is she referring to? So that, I think this is regarding co-signer release, which each lender does a little bit differently. And so some lenders have this uh, basically set of rules that says, if you've made X number of on-time monthly payments, or if you, uh, let's say like the student has a credit score above Y, then you as the parent can be released as a co-signer on that loan. You're no longer legally responsible for helping pay it back. It's no longer on your credit report. There's no more risk associated with it. Each lender handles co-sign release a little bit differently. Uh, Sally May has a co-signer release option. So do a lot of other lenders. Uh, I know, like SoFi and Ascent and Nelnet and a bunch of others also have uh, standardized cosigner release options. There's a second way that some lenders choose to handle cosigner release, which is to say, 
instead of setting up this set of rules that you have to meet in order to be released, um, some lenders argue that it's easier to just refinance that loan after the student graduates. And what that means is similar to a refinance on a home, you'd be taking out a new loan from a new lender to pay off the old loan. Um, and once a student has graduated and they've started working and uh, they have income that they can prove, they're viewed as less risky by different banks and credit unions, which means uh, it's easier to lend money to them directly without having you as the parent to back up that loan. And once the loan is refinanced then, and that old one is paid off, then that is effectively another form of co-signer release because that old loan doesn't exist anymore. Um, but honestly, um, finding out the details on a lender's co-signer release is important. Um, along with the same question somebody you know asked about if the parent, if the co-signer dies, um, these are important questions. Again, we're kind of giving you a summary, but it's really important to ask each lender that you're applying to what their specific policies are regarding um, all of these features. Um, a question about what if somebody is denied the Parent PLUS loan? Um, who is actually denying them and what are their options? Uh, so if you're denied a Parent PLUS loan, there's a set of reasons why that can happen on the Department of Education website. So you're getting denied directly by the federal government. Um, and the reasons why are that you've got, uh, let's say, like a wage garnishment or a tax lien or uh, something on your credit report that's a large balance that's more than 90 days late. Those are some of the reasons why there are other reasons why you could also be denied. If that happens, the, I'd say, most direct action that you can take is to request that your student is now classified as an independent student rather than a dependent student. And what that actually means is that they'll be able to borrow a little bit more money through that federal direct loan program. So instead of borrowing $5,500 for a freshman year, they would be able to borrow $9,500. Uh, so that's, that's really the primary action you can take in the case of denial. There's actually one more thing you can do, and I honestly forget what it's called. It has a certain name. It's similar to like you're being um, getting a cosigner. You can get um, endorser, a co and like an endorser, right? So um, um, you'd have to find somebody with good credit, and they can be your endorser for the Parent Plus loan. So that it is one other option you could look into. Um. So. Somebody's asking how much money should they ask for? They still haven't gotten the bill. Um, the best way to estimate this would be to go to the school's financial aid website and check what the cost of attendance number is. Uh, so each school will have this published on, on the website. And it's typically a number that's uh, supposed to represent the full academic year. So whatever school you're going to, just go there, see what that number is, and use that as a guidepost for, uh, for how much it might cost. Um, another oh, good question about, um, Heather's asking, basically, they have some money set aside for savings, and she's wondering if they should use it all at once um, or, uh, or spread it out. Um, and really, what I think you're asking, Heather, which would apply to other people, um, is uh, maybe, Chris, you can talk a little bit more about um, if you don't take a loan one year, can you get access to it in other years? This is the federal loan. Uh, so, yeah, this is an interesting scenario. For that federal direct loan, the one that's in the name of the student directly, if you don't use it in a given year, you can't catch up the second year. So I said you can borrow 5,500 first year, 6,500 second year. If you don't use the 5,500 in the first year, you can still only borrow 6,500 in that second year. Uh, there, there's really no, no catch up period there. And so I would say uh, because that has pretty low rates and has a lot of protections, I would still use that one all four years. Uh, and then the question of whether to use your incremental cash or to use a loan, uh, to me, it would come down to what rate am I qualifying for? 
uh, if I'm qualifying for rates that are excessively high, maybe I do want to use my cash now and see if I can get a lower rate loan later. Uh, but the downside of that is that you're giving up a little bit of liquidity. You might have a little bit less breathing room. So it does become a much more personal decision at that point. Um, Allison's asking, I have twins. Do I apply for each of them or can they apply once for a loan that covers both students? Uh, unfortunately, you'll have to apply for each of them separately each year. Yeah. Yeah. Just as the same as you had to um, um, fill out two separate FAFSAs. And um, again, if they need to, if your family needs to borrow, then your twins should also be taking out the federal direct loans first, and they will each have their own um, loans. So think of each twin as, you know, they are a separate borrower, um, even though you might be a co-signer on both their loans. Um, can you refinance the loan for this year for each drop next year? That's a good question. Uh, great question. Yeah, might get a little bit in the weeds here, but you're eligible to refinance typically uh, six months before a job start date. So if this is your student's final year of school, then it's very possible to take out a loan now and for them to refinance it, uh, let's say at some point in the middle of 2024. Uh, but if it's anything earlier than their senior year, then most likely you'll need to wait until uh, really when they're in their final year of school and they have a job offer that they've signed that's within six months of the day that you want to refinance. Um, another interesting question, uh, Natalie saying, I have a friend who took out a life insurance policy on their daughter after taking out parent loans for her very expensive college. So I guess the question that people should understand is why would families consider a life insurance policy on their students? Uh, it's, it's an interesting question. In the past, there have been times when uh, if something happened to the student, then the parent would still be on the hook for the loan. But right now, uh, basically the way the rules are set up for federal loans and for most private loans is that if something did happen to your daughter, uh, whether it's death or a permanent disability, then the loan can be fully discharged so that the life insurance wouldn't really be necessary. Um, will lenders keep giving full amounts of cost of attendance year after year? What if you have two children in college at the same time? So I think what this person might really be asking is, how do they know that they might be approved for loans in future years when they're you know, paying for two students at once? Okay, what is there the possibility that they might max out? So there's not a possibility that you would max out, but there is a possibility that you wouldn't qualify for private loans every single year for two students if, uh, let's say, the amount that you're borrowing is a lot relative to your income. Uh, but the amount, there's no cap on parent plus loans. And it, there's no lifetime cap. So say you had five children in school at the same time, um, it's no different than having one. You could still use a federal parent plus loan to borrow all the way up to the cost of attendance for each student for each year. Um, another question, Brian's asking, my son's an incoming freshman, but he's gonna be starting a master's degree. Does he need to update the FAFSA? Will that provide any more aid? So you do need to fill out FAFSA every single year that you're going to school and you want federal student aid. Uh, that's, it's a, this is a common issue uh, where people have filled it out, let's say recently, and they've now crossed the threshold, you have to do it for a second year. Please do make sure that you fill it out again. Uh, and as they enter graduate school, there's slightly different federal student loan programs that they're eligible for than the ones that we've discussed right now. Yeah, I think, and Brian, correct me, I think Brian's saying he is the parent is going to do a master's program and he's got a freshman. And unfortunately, it's not going to make a difference on your FAFSA. The only thing that would make it 
actually, and that's changing too. So I was going to say the only thing that would make a difference if you had multiple students in college, but that's not going to be the case going forward anymore. So unfortunately, the fact that you are going to be in school at the same time as your son is not going to impact um, the FAFSA or any aid that the college might give him. Um, it is a question uh, about, uh, should somebody take out a loan for fresh, uh, for the fall semester and then a separate loan for the spring semester? Or should they just take out a loan that covers the whole year and how would that work? So in many scenarios, it actually won't matter what you decide to do. And the reason why is when you choose to take a loan out for the full year, it's all automatically split up into the number of terms uh, in your academic year. So if you're on a semester system and you borrow $20,000, 10,000 is sent in the fall, 10,000 is sent in the spring. Some people choose to say, I'm gonna apply for $10,000 to the fall now, and I'll wait to see where rates are at and I'll apply for another $10,000 in the spring. That is an option you can take. My recommendation is typically to just apply for the full thing right now and lock it in. Uh, the reason being, let's say 10,000 is sent to the school next month and you have 10,000 more scheduled to go to the school in January for the spring semester. If rates drop between now and January, you can actually cancel that spring portion of the loan and reapply and get approved for a lower rate. Uh, but if you don't have, but conversely, if rates go up, then uh, you would be better off if you had already locked in something for the spring. And so I would just think of it as do the full year because it just gives you more optionality. You've locked in some baseline and you have the flexibility to cancel the second half of that later if you want to. Good tips and tricks. This is all about kind of making sure um, that uh, you know you, you you can cover that you're covered and you know um, you have different options. Um, let's see. So Bridget's asking that basically that their financial situation has changed, um, but they now have two in college. Can they update their financial information to possibly qualify for more aid? Absolutely, yes. So when it comes to need-based financial aid. All a school knows is what you wrote in your financial aid application on the day that you submitted it. If anything has changed between when you submitted that application and today, uh, whether it's somebody else is going to school now, or there's been some change in family income or a job loss or a health condition, please do let the financial aid office know because it gives them the opportunity to change the assumptions and how they calculate how much uh, aid to give you, and primarily how much of a discount to potentially give you, which is free money that doesn't have to be paid back. Uh, the worst that you can hear is, I'm sorry, there's nothing more we can do, but there are many scenarios where you can actually get more free money from the school just by updating them on what happened. Um, so Chris, maybe you can give again, which is fine, a little bit more explanation about Juno. Somebody asked earlier, is there a fee? And now somebody is asking, does Juno do a hard or credit inquiry? Um, and maybe even just explain the kind of what Juno is relative to the partners you work with and who's really doing the inquiry, the credit yeah. inquiry. Uh, yeah, thanks for the question. So Juno's not doing any hard credit check on anybody, uh, but the lenders that we would introduce you to would require a hard credit check before you lock in your rates. So, so just to be clear, just I mean, you're great guys, but you but Juno's not a lender. <laughs> yeah. We are not a lender. Uh, we really just exist as this layer to aggregate demand among students and parents and then get lenders to provide better rates and terms to this group. Uh, but in order to actually lock in a loan with any of those lenders that we partner with, you will have to do a hard credit check at some point in the process. Uh, so I, I, I do want to be fully transparent about that. Uh, but in this whole process, you can just kind of think of this as a free option that would help you explore rates and terms that you might not get if you just went on Google and search best student loans. And so if you fill out your profile and you check out what options we have available to you, there is no fee. We don't collect payment information. Uh, the only thing you'll get from us is a handful of emails uh, that 
that will just tell you about the different offers that we've made available, along with some links to a, a calculator that we've built that helps walk people through exactly how to compare their private student loan quotes to the cost of a Parent PLUS loan and see what option might be better for them. So just, and just to kind of summarize and, and reiterate what Chris is saying, and somebody actually said it in the quotes they said, or in the chats, they said, uh, it, it's just so nice to finally have a company that's on our side. And, um, you know, you can kind of view it like that. Juno is kind of this negotiating power um, by, you know, trying to collect um, a lot of borrowers who need to borrow and basically using that um, collective power to try and negotiate a better rate and then offer that back to the families. And then, so you have a sense of, um, of knowing that you got the best rate out there. Um, either you got the best rate out there because you found it yourself and, you know, maybe Juno can't match it, but, uh, or you did your research and Juno can get you a better rate. So um, it's kind of a feeling, um, a, you know, a sense of a reassurance that you're, that you're getting the best that you possibly can. Um, so somebody, let's see, um, my daughter will be living off campus. How do you get access to funds for rent if funding goes directly to the school? So this is a great question from Mary. Uh, the way the loan process works is whatever you amount that you borrow, whether it's from the federal government or a private lender or a state-based lender is always sent directly to the school first. And then the school subtracts out the tuition plus mandatory fees. And if you borrowed more than that and there's some amount left over, then you typically can log into a portal on your financial aid website uh, where that there's an account that money is sitting in. And then you can transfer that to your personal account to use for rent or for other purposes. But just to know, you know, as um Chris just explained, I mean, that's the case, but sometimes it, but you should just understand the timing of when um, you or your student need the money, particularly if, you know, you have to pay something off campus because it might take the school a little bit of, of time to get that money into your student's account that they can then, um, you know, um, use that money. Uh, so I would contact the school and understand what their timing is. Yeah, it's a really good, really good point because the tuition due date is thinking about that's the day that the school tells all the lenders, please wire me the money. And it's typically just a few days before classes start. Right. So if your student is going to campus a few weeks early, as a lot of people do, uh, then they won't really be able to access that uh, loan money to pay for room and board until uh, realistically- It probably could be a few weeks after school starts. Yeah. So, I mean, you'll get access to the money, but it's a cash flow issue about when you'll be able to get it. Yeah. Um, let's see, what's left? A lot of great questions. Thank you yeah. for being here. Can I jump in again? Yeah. yeah. Okay, I'm the independent kiddo, right? <laughs> So we, I'm trying to figure out the Parent Plus because who, who puts the qualification on the Parent Plus? Because I was told from the, the financial aid department, he wouldn't qualify since he's been deemed a Parent Plus. So is that the school who's doing that? Or are these loans coming from the federal government? I thought the Department of Education. So I'm really confused and not knowing if I'm really getting the correct information. So that was one. And then my second one would be, are there minimum loans? So is there a minimum amount that we can pull on these different type of loans? Do we have to hit a minimum or does that make sense? But the second question, there's not a minimum that I'm aware of for federal student loans. Okay, uh, excellent. But private lenders do have different minimums. Some of them okay. are as low as 1,000, some right. as low as 5,000. That's the range typically. Uh, okay. As for who approves the Parent PLUS loan, I'll just throw in the link to the federal uh, Parent Plus website in the chat right now, uh, but it is uh, rules based on the Department of Education. And so uh, if, if you're denied and you make an appeal, that appeal actually goes um, through the federal government. I'm confused when you mentioned that the school is saying your student, like that your student's being approved or not for the parent loan, it's you. 
Exactly. That was my thing. My guts, it's just, it doesn't add up. We were told, of course, you can never get to the rep. Okay. So you play that crazy game with the school. So he basically put us on hold, talked to a rep and said, since he's been qualified from FAFSA, the um, independent, he is then not able then to go for a parent. We cannot go for a parent plus load, which makes zero sense to me. Oh, okay. So he is, okay. Well, I don't, he's been already identified as being independent. Yes. We that, didn't have a choice in that. We filled it out and that's what spit out at us. Really? Okay. To my knowledge. Yeah. Maybe, maybe you want to, maybe you can um, send me an email separately and we can dig in. Um, that, that is probably the, what's going on here. Yeah. If he's been identified as independent, then in theory, there, there aren't parents to take out a parent plus loan. Okay. Got it. Okay. So that makes sense. Okay. That's okay. I'm but good. the, but why he was declared independent, I don't, you might want to understand that quite Probably honestly. his age. We're the COVID year. We're the COVID year where you've lost two years. But how so old I, is, is he? He's over? He'd be 24 this coming year. It's 24. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that's why we hit that weird status. Yeah. So we have the delay with COVID. So that pushes you two years out. We did the to cut down costs. We did the community college and then came through. So we've had a little delay along the way. Interesting. I mean, I think what, I wouldn't have say, said that anything you did was wrong, but you're right. You hit into that, that age um, limit, which um, just, yeah, interesting. I would have also thought though, if he's been declared independent, that he would have gotten more aid from the college. We got a Pell grant, but that's not from the college, right? That's still government, correct? Right. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, exactly. And I don't know if it has to do because we're in a nursing and it's highly competitive programs. Could be. So it gets weird, but no, yeah. thank you so much. This has been amazing. No problem. I mean, so, I mean, you, you still have the option, even though he's been declared independent, he can still take out a student loan. And if he needs to have you co-sign, you can still do that. So, so it sounds like your, the yes, private that's lender. where we're headed. I just wanted yeah. to make sure because going off what Chris was saying to do your sub, unsub, federal loan, and then go out from there. So I just didn't know where I was amongst those steps, what I was entitled to. And um, yeah. so I don't trust any of them. I need to know when I didn't know the information. So yeah, no, sorry. Perfect. I mean, most people aren't at that 24 age. I know. I'm, limit I'm yet, sure so. you might have more with COVID people. Yeah, <laughs> that is true. I hadn't thought about it. We might run into that. Yeah. More. Yeah. Uh-huh. Uh, okay, awesome. Thank you. No problem. Okay, anything, any other questions you, you scroll back and saw, Chris? So somebody's asking, I lost my job in early July. Obviously, that will affect our total household income when applying for a private loan. Should I ask the school if I can have a grace period to see if I can get a new job in the next few weeks so I can have a more positive interest rate? In this scenario, candidly, I I would suggest just using the Parent PLUS loan if you're able to, because uh, it will give you a bit more flexibility. And we're so close to the tuition due dates that even if you got, let's say, a, a new job, but the issue you might run into is that uh, for proof of income, lenders will typically require something like two pay stubs. And so it might take too long in order to be able to qualify for a private loan option. Uh, and so I, I would recommend just using the, the Parent PLUS loan, at least for the first semester. Uh, and then you could see if you qualify for a lower private rate for the spring semester or just for next year. Uh, so there's another really good question about how interest, how student loan interest rates are um, determined and are they connected at all to the mortgage rate? Uh, Sort of. So the way they're calculated for federal student loans is based on a law Congress passed a little bit over a decade ago. And so every year, the federal government resets what price new student loans are at. And the way they do it is by taking uh, the price of a 10-year treasury rate at some point in the month of May, and then they add a certain amount to it. It's like a fixed percentage. And so every year uh, there is a new number that gets published, all new loans that exist for that year um, that get taken out that year are at that rate and they stay that rate until you pay them off. And so federal student loans, they're absolutely tied to that 
basically the, the same fluctuations that mortgage rates are tied to, uh, but they're fixed. So they'll always stay the same once you take it out. Private student loans fluctuate similarly. They basically are impacted in the same exact way, but you might have a fixed loan or you might have a variable loan. That's one of the things that you get to choose when you're looking at private loans. I'd say at this point, well over 90% of the people that we talk to at Juno opt to take fixed rates. Um, right now, it's, it's a little bit paradoxical, but variable interest rates are higher than fixed interest rates at almost every private student lender that exists. I haven't seen that ever before. I was going to say, I haven't seen that in the longest of time. <laughs> yeah. uh, so there really isn't much of an advantage to consider using a variable loan at this period of time. Um, but yes, they basically, as mortgage markets move, student loan rates also tend to move in roughly the same direction. And and I'm sorry, I was answering a question. Did you uh, mention how are the federal um, student loan interest rates determined? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so have another question that Lori's asking, I guess when you apply to a student, a private student loan, are they, even though one parent is the cosigner, are they looking at the combined income of both parents? Um, again, something that differs slightly from lender to lender, but most of the time, just one parent. Okay, um, just to let you know, this session was recorded. We will send the link tomorrow. It was. It's also on Facebook. Um, if you want to find it there, but we'll we'll you know if you go to the Road to College Facebook page, it's listed as well. Um, and um, if you, Chris, if you want to give your email address, if, if people have questions, people can always um, also send questions to me at debbie at roadtocollege.com. Yeah. And our uh, hello at joinjuno.com inbox is monitored all the time. So if you have any questions, if you even want somebody to hop on a quick Zoom and walk through a specific scenario one on one, you can always email that inbox. Um, or there's another functionality on our website where you can book a time with somebody on our team. Um, and really, for the next few months, our calendars are freed for this purpose exactly. Actually, one last quick, good, quick, quick question. Alex is asking: Do both parents have to make a separate Juno account to find out if which one would get the better rate? Uh, that's a good question. So you you don't really need to. I, I'd say honestly, there's not much point in doing that. What you you can just change the assumptions in the tool that lets you check what rate you might be eligible for based on like one person's credit score or one person's income um, and then just use that to decide who to move forward with you don't really need to spend the time to make a second account okay well but, thanks chris thanks for everybody for joining us in the middle of the day i guess um, i'm just going by east coast time if it's lunch time for most people and um um, I know the next few weeks are busy, particularly you know, answering a lot of these questions as the tuition bills are coming due. Um, Chris uh, and I were talking before we got on that uh, most in the next 30 days, most um, students' tuition bills are going to be due, particularly on the East Coast and maybe a little bit longer on the West Coast. So it's um, a harried time if you're still trying to figure out loans. So please uh, go to Juno and create your free account. Again, just to kind of get peace of mind to know that you're getting the lowest interest rate. And if you have questions, feel free to email me or Chris. Um, we just want to make sure that you guys are getting the best information you can and making good decisions. Absolutely. Thank you, everybody, for the time, for all the engagement. And Debbie, thank you, as always, for being such a great host. No problem. Thanks, everybody. See you soon. Bye.